we're really grateful that Mark was started originally. Um, I actually interrupted my own thing. When the Nasher had the show a couple of years ago of uh, Cross County Lines, uh, you guys might not know this, but I do it. In the room that your work was in and your work was in, I was right between you two. Guys. <laughs> And that was an honor in and of itself. Um, so, you know, Martin's work uh, is examined preserving memory, capturing beauty and wonder, and exploring personal identity and belonging. And that's yeah, probably everything she does. It's photography, it's writing, it's editing. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a mission of everything that she's been involved in. She's a visual artist, a writer, an editor, a curator, an educator. She has a hand in producing countless books, many of them with her partner, Alex Harris. Um, the, the recent work, Torn, which we're going to see later tonight, The Problem of Human Behavior, is now displayed in both the PS 19 and the Horse and Buggy, correct? The Problem of Human Behavior is at um, Broad Street Gallery, okay. and Torn, a year that changed everything, a slightly different body of work this year, PS 20. I recommend seeing both. Just right out there. Right out there. Yeah, right up, right up parachute, right there. Uh, uh, her, what we'll see tonight, we can sort of see it here. What I'm fascinated with is, is even though she has a very long history of photography, this is a different body of work uh, about sort of redacted storytelling. And I'm going to stop right there and say I just look forward to hearing what you're going to share about your creative process and the art of what you do. Welcome, Margaret. I think he 
might, that might even be true. This irresistible woman looking over my shoulder is my mother, Tommy Sue. Years before she was my mother. And I usually start any talk about photography with pictures of my parents because, well, that's where everything started. Who made this picture? Who is she looking at? That would be my father. Both my parents grew up in small towns in Louisiana. My father, Fred, was a doctor. He loved medicine. He loved history. And he loved trying to understand how things worked. He was very smart, very kind, and precisely the kind of person you wanted there making life and death decisions on a regular basis. But he was not a talkative man. And he certainly didn't speak about his emotions. This is a picture he made of my mother and my oldest sister, Susan. But I'm showing you these pictures my father made, uh, in part because I studied these photographs when I was growing up. The same way I scrutinized our beloved encyclopedias, because I wanted to know them. And pictures were obviously a crucial source of information. This picture, for instance, speaks to the relationship between my older sister and my mother, between each of them and my father. Susan's teenage insouciance is in her physical demeanor. Uh, my mother's comfort in her own body and, and being photographed. That interests me. <laughs> you can laugh at this because I think it's funny. Anyway, this is my older sister Susan, also with my mother. No, it's not a photograph by Diane Artis. <laughs> so for my father, photography was a way of letting us know he was there, that he was paying attention, and above all, that we mattered to him. Photography was kind of an everyday game. For my family. This is a photo staged by my dad who's meeting on the right. That's me in the middle and midair, and my brother in Italy on the left. <laughs> that was me between Horn and my parents' bedroom. The camera was around all the time and not just for birthdays or vacations. Here, my dad has roped my mother into an experiment using a pin light um, during a long exposure. And the thing is with this is that you never knew what the person drew in the pin light until you saw the eventual photograph. My mother drew an elephant. I don't know why. And this was my <laughs> contribution to that game. So even when I was a teenager, I was combining my interests in both words. And pictures. This is me as a teenager. So I was the third daughter in the middle of five children. And my goal growing up was just not to rock the boat. While my older sisters were arguing and my younger siblings were entertaining, I just wanted to be left to my own devices, which was mostly how it worked in my household. And seeing this picture was my thing my mother would lean down and look at me or sometimes look sideways ways at me in the car when I was staring out the window and tell me about how I was going to have permanent wrinkles in my forehead from thinking too much. <laughs> of course, she was right. This is a diptych of found photographs that I put together. That's my hand on the right. Because it's not only my photographs that I'm drawn to. For years I've collected scrapbooks and snapshots, and sometimes it's the mystery of not knowing who the people are or what the story is behind the picture that engages me. But primarily it's the honesty of healing. That the photograph depicts a 
history, but it also has a history, indicated in the folds, the fading, the tears, the handwritten messages. There's something about family photographs that is straightforward and simple, but at the same time, emotionally revealing and complex. Because as with my own photographs, what these pictures sometimes communicate is the desire we all have to know and connect with the people that matter to us. And the best ones, they go straight to the heart. To the heart of the I collect other old things. Paper, diagrams, postal stamps, matchbooks, detritus, really, or vestiges, things left behind that had a history that suggested in their wear and tear. And then when I put them together, it suggests stories to me. This one is called The Remains of the Sun. The Remains. I actually collect words and phrases, and sometimes the words suggest an image or shape or a relationship of shapes. So in this collage, these words are familiar to anyone who would in the South. How many times have I heard? Girl, give me some sugar. And though I've been collecting these pieces for a while, I only began making these collages about five years ago. This is one of the very first ones I had finished. It's titled, Your Safety is Largely Your Home. Creating a collage is uh, a lot like constructing a puzzle, putting together the pieces, following a flow of thought and feeling, waiting to see if you can judge, I'm sorry, when you can nudge it to a place where it adds up to something. This collage is titled Mine. It's the same with photographing for a lot of photographers. Most, in fact, construct a photograph, a picture from the concrete facts right in front of you, not quite knowing what you're looking for, but sensing that something is there and hoping that if you pay close attention, you'll recognize it when you see it. This is a Polaroid I made of my father with my youngest sister, Emily, who was born when I was a teenager. By the time I made this, I had moved away from home. I was a person on a journey. My sister, Emily, I made this picture of her in 1985. A year after our father died, the year I began to photograph my family and my family, and the year I began to learn the essential thing necessary for all observers of camera, that is how to live in a world and at the same time step back, become strangers in order to photograph. So I pursued this project of photographing my family in hometown off and on for years. And so many of you are familiar with these pictures. And some of them I can't help but see a certain quality that at times troubles me. I'm talking about a quality of aloneness. Not loneliness, exactly. More like solitude of the existential kind, of the inevitable kind. This is a portrait of my son. I photographed him on the backyard of the patio of the house where I grew up. Again, my sister Emily. Making pictures has given me a kind of access. In the same way 
gave my father access. That is, he gave me an excuse, one that I didn't have to defend or explain, to watch, to study, the people that mattered to me. That would have been hard to do without the camera to mediate. This is Emily around age 13. She was a catcher in the summer softball league. She, like my oldest sister, is a natural athlete. She played basketball. She was on the tennis team. I did none of those things. I do recognize that the picture depicts this solitariness, but it is my hope that the pictures also depict beauty and resilience and something of the unique lives of the people in front of my camera. Because that's what a portrait should do. So that when we look at the picture, we feel they are looking at someone, and that we can in some way know this person or take some measure of them. So sometimes when I make a portrait, it's also about the way the person in front of the camera mirrors my own feelings of being in the world. And it is myself I'm making measure of. So these new pieces I approach in a similar way that I use the camera. Because in doing them, I'm on a kind of a search. I'm looking hard at what's in front of me and trying to be attentive to how that resonates with what's inside me. This one reads, those who pass for normal understand this is the delicate part. Interestingly, it was uh, a while after I finished this piece that someone pointed out to me that the sentence I constructed out of the words I found on the page is not only about the interior life, it is literally internalized in the minds of the female figure. It's a challenge to depict the interior life of someone through photography, which is a medium that necessarily describes the outside. This is a high school graduation party. Girls on the cusp of becoming women. And I won't try to explain this picture, but I will tell you how familiar this scene is to me, and that it took leaving, stepping back from this world, to be able to see it, to be alert to the expression and gestures and indicate emotions, and formally to be aware of the overlapping lines, patterns of the dresses, the walls that surround them, flowers. Back squares, dots, bricks. You'll see these again in the work I've been doing lately. Um, sometimes the form is enough. And that elicits a feeling from me. My hope is that it also elicits a feeling from someone else that has nothing with me. This is a photograph I made at the church my family attended when I was growing up, and this is the room where I went to Sunday school every Sunday. I actually liked Sunday school. <laughs> when I hit my teens, I started attending services all over town, from the Pentecostals to the Catholics. Because these were the places where big questions were being asked. Who are we? Why are we here? And what can we do about it? And that is what I was looking for. Suffice it to say, during these years, I was born again. And again. <laughs> and again. <laughs> Until I wasn't. Growing up, around so much water had an impact. Behind my home was a levee, and on the other side of that levee, a very wide river called the Washita. I made this picture while walking on the other side of the levee. 
These are some of the swamp areas that are left behind as the levee, as the river rises and falls every season and it changes. Never the same. This is my cousin, first cousin Rob. He's in my mother's kitchen. He come by that day to cut her grass. Rob had hoped at one point to play professional football, but that didn't work out in the end. I remember this day though, how he leaned back against the counter and removed his cap and told the story about a certain Sunday dinner at our grandmother's house. Like so many men I knew growing up. Maybe it's a southern thing, maybe it's a small town thing. But Rob was quiet and reserved. He had a lot going on inside, but he wasn't equipped to express those emotions. This is a photograph my father made of my mother at my grandmother's house. When my parents were at this point courting. That's how my grandmother called it. And this photograph always knocks me out. Because a woman in this picture will forever be falling in love at the man who is looking back at her. And that strange, dark shadow will always be falling behind her, framing this moment. Simple picture. It's also for me extremely complicated. This is my mother 40 years later. She'd been widowed for more than a dozen years by this time. I made it in the backyard. There's the levee on the left. Sometimes a picture is not about what a person reveals to you or what you can see, but what you can't see. How you can't get inside that person and experience what they experience. One of the new pieces. This is on a musical score by a song, uh, a song by Jordan Kern. It reads, I try to hide, but my eyes won't conceal. I try to tell myself, this isn't real. Another early photograph. The Catholic starter on the porch of a playhouse built for her by her father. Houses appear often in my photographs and in my dreams. Corners too, and bricks. This is Daniel Ryan Sarter III, Catherine's father, who built the playhouse. Ryan is carpenter. So I want to show you just a few more pictures. These are people, I, there are people I photographed again and again. My daughter Eliza is one of them, and here she is on the levee behind the house where I grew up. This is a harvested cotton field on the farm where my father grew up, where his father grew up. My niece Morgan appears in a number of pictures, and here she's playing, or playing, in my mother's driveway. I mean, one of the things that photography taught me is that even the most banal of moments is an opportunity to take the mind and the imagination to deeper places. This is Eliza with her dad, Alex, my husband, is here. And again, Eliza, I believe, this time in the driveway of our home here in Durham. So houses appear repeatedly in my work, and when I finally looked it up, I read that a house usually represents a place.
place where we can express a private and unguarded self within an increasingly public world. And that dreaming about can symbolize how you present yourself to the world, intentionally or not. This is the last photograph I'm going to show. I made it when my mother decided to sell the house by the levee where I and my siblings grew up and most of these photographs were made. I went to Louisiana to help her pack, move the last pieces of furniture, clean out the drawers and the cabinets. On the day she signed the paper, she let it go. I made this picture, one of the last in this series a view from the inside of the house, looking out, which is perhaps a good introduction to what comes next. To you. And at the same time, turning away from you is difficult and needs like a leash in a box. Peculiar that moves and the movement are similar to, but not unlike, the movement of the stars. Long of the night. We go to pieces. Under the surface, you are gliding. Keep coming up for air inside the whale.
A circle has more space than squares. <laughs> this is obvious. Circle it! <laughs> White men, the fat, tragic disillusionment. <laughs> Useless. So perfect the machinery. The heart sometimes breaks. Compelling life to stand still. Repairing the unceasing destruction. <laughs> the problem of human behavior. The end. Which gradually becomes the beginning. Is a somewhat obvious means of the revolving escape. You are the error. Go swift and far.
Has any questions for Margaret? Meredith is so. <laughs> It did, and um, the, the show that's up at Broad Street is a 
installation of 25 pieces, and they're in a grid, and they're very much, I, they're sequenced linearly from upper left to lower right, but also I kind of thought about the different ways, which is right in keeping with doing uh, the work, not this one, but the ones on the book pages, um, because, you know, you're, you're constructing a sentence, but you're just kind of responding intuitively, so I wanted people to walk up to the installation and maybe be drawn to a piece and then be drawn to another piece, you know, and not think too much about it, but um, I think it's, I think one of the things that interests me about finding the poems in another text is that there, there are all these stories, I mean, you can redact um, and find an infinite number of stories. And so it, it's, it's just, it's almost like dream work, really. Um, so, uh, oh, and we introduced that one that had the dark self and the light self in it. That was not, in, that's not on view at the, the gallery, but the one, introspection um, is difficult, right? Conscience is tricky. Um, and that felt like, oh, okay. Yeah. It, so it's all hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's all hard. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing some of your insights about the family photographs and the moments. Um, I mean, I love that, like what you can see in your mother in love at that point, and then what you can't see in the subsequent photo. Yeah. Have you ever written? I mean, you're putting words to those images as you presented them this evening. Have you ever written, written about your perceptions of those photos? Um, I've written a lot about my perceptions of other people's photographs, um, and and I've given talks about that work, but I haven't I haven't done for myself what I've done for Dr. Louis Gedney or Humana, um, because I haven't really known what my way in is. Um, and doing this work and talking actually tonight has kind of given me a better idea of what actually my pictures are about. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of waiting for that light bulb to go off, and, but I'm sure that it, it I think it will. Um, I don't ever feel rushed about work I do. It takes as long as it takes. So, um, and I don't think I'm talking about anything timely. I'm talking about things that are uh, sort of essential for all of us. And, I do think we all, that photography sense of vengeance, that our memories are shaped by photography, our uh, sense of ourselves is shaped by photography. I mean, it's, it's uh, the power of photography comes at you, morally it comes at you, personally it comes at you in so many ways, so I'm infinitely interested in that. Um, so I'll do it sometime soon. Thank you for saying that you're in here. I love your responses to William Benny's photographs. I just thank you. It was your presentation to you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I do intend to write about it. I, I will sometime. If I'm done or go blind. <laughs> um, anybody else have a question? Thanks. Yeah, thanks again.